Hello, welcome everybody to this afternoon panel uh, uh, at this year's CPDP. Um, we're talking about an expert take on Schrems 2 from the experts from Schrems 2. This is a panel that was organized by the Cordell Institute for Policy in Medicine and Law at Washington University in St. Louis. My name is Judith Rahofer. I am a senior lecturer in IT law at the University of Edinburgh and an associate director of the Script Center in Intellectual Property and Technology Law. Uh, I'm a debt protection lawyer like most people at this conference and I'm going to be the moderator for this panel. Um, of course, everybody is probably aware of the CJU's decision uh, in July 2020 of, in the case of Data Protection Commissioner versus Facebook Ireland Limited and Maximilian Schrems, which is generally known as Schrems 2. In Schrems 1, we of course all know the court declared invalid the EU-US Safe Harbor Agreement from the year 2000. And as a result, the EU and the US agreed a new international agreement named the Privacy Shield which, while it wasn't the subject of this case, was certainly a casualty of this. So on this panel, we are going to hear from some of the experts whose expert testimony in Schrems 2 was the basis for the court's decision. And we'll find out more about the trial in Dublin, uh, and what they found surprising or not about uh, the court, what, what the court essentially found. Uh, we follow the normal traditional way. We will give each of the experts a few minutes to talk about uh, themselves, you know, how they actually experienced the court case during the time, what they uh, found. I will briefly introduce them and then we're going to uh, have opportunity afterwards for questions, including questions from the audience. Uh, about basically the way forward. Uh, so if any of the audience wants to ask any questions, please use the chat for that. And once we have heard from all of the panelists, I'm going to pick up on questions from the audience. So um, I will first, as I said, briefly introduce our panelists. We have uh, four of them. The first of them is Andrew Serbin, who is a partner at the San Diego office of a law firm DLA Piper. The second one is Ashley Gorski, a senior staff attorney at the ACLU's National Security Project. The third is Neil Richards, uh, who is an internationally recognized expert in privacy law and information law, and he is the Thomas and Carol Green Professor of Law at Washington University School of Law. And finally, there's going to be Alan Butler, who is the Interim Executive Director and General Counsel at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC. So we're going to start with um, Andrew uh, in the beginning. And Andrew, if you could just talk about for five minutes uh, about you know how you came to be involved in the case, and what your particular area of expertise was, what expert testimony you actually provided, and what your impression of the process and the court was when when giving evidence. Um, so. Again, Andrew is a, as I said, a partner at the uh, at DLA Piper, and he is also the U.S. Chair and Global Co-Chair Data Protection, Privacy, and Security Practice, and the U.S. and Global Co-Chair of the Cybersecurity Practice. There, he's a preeminent privacy and security practitioner, and he is an inaugural inductee uh, to the 2017 Legal Hall of Fame, which is comprised of outstanding U.S. lawyers who have been recommended as Legal 500 lawyers for the last six consecutive years. So quite a lot of experience. Andrew, would you like to make a start? Sure, happy to, and thanks uh, Thanks for the intro kind introduction. Uh, my role in this was, I guess, somewhat a, a little different uh, in the sense that I was, for better or worse, the first on this. And I remember I was on a, a brief three-day vacation over a weekend with my son in a hotel room and I got what I thought was this random email saying, uh, we represent the Data Com Protection Commissioner of Ireland, uh, and we want to have you write an assessment of and analyze US law on certain issues. And I remember thinking, is this actually like a real email? <laughs> um, and so, uh, of course, it turned out it was. Um, so that was my introduction to the case and working with uh, Data Protection Commissioner uh, Helen Dixon and, and the legal team there. Uh, my role was to obviously try to give an objective view of U.S. law uh, in the national security space on really remedies um, was, was I'd say, the core part of my testimony. But implicit in that was obviously the entire national security uh, framework for U.S. law 
um, both in terms of scope and in terms of the remedies because they were sort of intertwined. And so I wrote a memo that was then uh, referenced in the draft decision, uh, or excuse me, in the, uh, the draft complaint that was filed. And that then was disclosed, uh, I believe in October. Uh, so I, I did that work in April, May of that year of uh, 2016. And then uh, ultimately that, that report was released. And then uh, there were obviously reactions to certain parts of the complaint that were uh, based on my memo. Uh, but then um, both, uh, well, certainly Ashley, and Neil and others in the case uh, then had the memo sort of to react to and then uh, kind of work through it through through trial and ultimately, um, you know, obviously testimony for, for many of us. So um, moving past, obviously, then I had to respond to the other experts. And then um, I was uh, on the stand for, I think it was two days um, in, in Ireland, working through uh, the testimony um, as well and responding to the other experts. So that was really, my role, uh, I kind of kicked it off for lack of a better term and um, found the processes we'll talk about more to be uh, certainly different than the US in certain ways, it's very similar uh, in other ways, but it was a, a much more collaborative process, I'd say, particularly among the experts than it would be normally in the US, even with the sort of, I believe it was the Scott process that we all, Scott matrix we created to sort of work through the issue. So it was, uh, it was an interesting case for any number of reasons, obviously given its profile, but also sort of how the case played out and uh, working with uh, the other experts, uh, including those on this call. So that was my initial take and my role. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on then to Ashley. Ash uh, is, as I said, the senior staff attorney at the ACLU's National Security Project, where she works on issues related to US government surveillance and national security prosecutions. <clears throat> Ashley has provided uh, expert testimony on US surveillance law in uh, several international for fora, and she's a graduate of Yale College and Harvard Law School. Ashley, can you talk to us a little bit about who, how you came to be part of the case? Of course. Thanks, Judith. Um, these issues really came onto my radar after the demise of Safe Harbor. And at that point, I connected with Max Schrems through a colleague of mine at the ACLU. And the ACLU initially sought leave to participate as an amicus in the case to provide the court with our perspective on uh, US surveillance law and practice and remedies. Uh, but for reasons that remain unclear, uh, the court denied our application. It did grant the application of another organization, EPIC, Alan Butler from EPIC is here to talk about their amicus submission. Uh, but all of that ended up turning out for the best because I was then able to participate as an expert witness um, in support of Max's case, but of course providing an objective assessment of what US surveillance law permits and obstacles to redress. And my report and subsequent testimony were focused on two key issues, uh, the breadth of US foreign intelligence surveillance and the obstacles to redress that I just mentioned. And on US foreign intelligence surveillance, I wrote about and discussed two key authorities, section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and Executive Order 12333 or 12333. And the simplest way to think about these two authorities is that Section 702 operates when the US government conducts surveillance inside the United States, and Executive Order 12333 operates when the government conducts surveillance outside the United States. And technically, the picture is a little more complicated, but that's the basic framework. And under Section 702, the US government has tremendous latitude to target any non US person abroad to gather foreign intelligence information, which is very broadly defined. Because that targeting standard is so low and because the number of targets is so high, today more than 200,000 individuals and groups, this is a form of mass surveillance. And so my testimony was designed to explain that to the court and explain the programs that operate under Section 702. Under Executive Order 12303, the government conducts a host of bulk surveillance programs, surveillance that is not targeted, and these include tapping the undersea cables running from Europe to the United States. And part of my job was to make these two authorities concrete um, and to explain how they function in practice. And I also wanted the Irish High Court to be able to understand how these two surveillance authorities connected to the standards articulated by the Court of Justice in Schrems 1 and to understand why US law failed to satisfy 
those standards because the Court of Justice had already made clear that if a third party country's laws are to be deemed adequate, then the non-EU country can interfere with the right to privacy only insofar as is strictly necessary and the government has to have an objective criterion capable of justifying its interference. And both of the surveillance authorities I just discussed uh, lack that objective criterion because they give the U.S. executive branch tremendous discretion to target um, non-U.S. persons abroad, including EU persons. The court in Schrems 1, as I'm sure many in the audience know, also said that generalized access to the content of communications violates the essence of the right to privacy, but that is exactly what the U.S. government does under Executive Order 12333. So um, my testimony was designed to explain you know, how 12333 operates and why it was relevant to the case. On the redress side of things, I wrote and testified about what I know very well from my personal experience, which involves challenging government surveillance in U.S. courts. And through that experience and through my understanding of the, the case law and the doctrine, uh, I was in a position to explain why it is enormously challenging to obtain redress for unlawful foreign intelligence surveillance in U.S. courts. And there are a couple significant hurdles. One is the standing doctrine, which requires that litigants demonstrate that they are concretely affected by the surveillance that they're challenging. And when you're talking about secret surveillance, that is very hard to do, uh, especially because as a general matter, individuals do not receive notice that their information has been collected by the U.S. government. And that lack of notice makes it very difficult for people who are subjected to surveillance to establish standing. And without standing, a U.S. court will not hear the merits of your case. Another significant obstacle is the state secrets privilege, which the U.S. government can invoke to dismiss lawsuits that it claims present an unacceptable risk of disclosure of national security secrets. And we argue in litigation that this privilege actually shouldn't apply in many cases challenging government surveillance, but that's something that we still fight in the courts and something where the U.S. government uh, is, is fighting hard against us. So as a result of these two doctrines, no civil lawsuit challenging the legality of Section 702 or EO 12333 surveillance has resulted in a U.S. court opinion addressing the lawfulness of that surveillance. And no litigant has obtained a remedy of any kind for either form of surveillance. A lot of the expert testimony was focused on what remedies might theoretically be available, but um, regardless of the nuances of <laughs> very complicated statutory remedies that might in, in theory uh, be available to a litigant, you have two significant obstacles in the standing and state secrets doctrines that render these remedies um, often illusory. And so I'll just wrap up by flagging that I think there are really interesting questions about what happens now going forward. There is obviously an interest in getting something settled quickly between the EU and the US, especially in light of the EDPB's draft guidance. I do think that there's a risk that the EU and US attempt to negotiate a new agreement based solely on commitments by the executive branch rather than a new agreement that is based on reforms enacted through legislation through the US Congress. Uh, but without U.S. legislative reforms, any new adequacy decision is going to fail to satisfy the Court of Justice. Those legislative reforms are absolutely essential. That's especially true with respect to remedies for reasons we can talk about more later in the hour. Thanks, Judith. Thank you very Thank much. You very yeah, much. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's definitely that's something, that's something that's I think we're going to pick up on again. Um, yes, so do I. Sorry. Um, so the next person uh, is then Neil Richards. So Neil is an internationally recognized expert in privacy law and a professor in law at uh, Washington University. Uh, he's an affiliate scholar with the Stanford Center for Internet and Society and uh, with the Yale Information Society project and he's a fellow at the Center for Democracy and Technology. And of course, to most of us uh, who teach in this area, he is the author of Intellectual Privacy. So Neil, would you like to continue? I, I would. Th th thank you, Judith. And let me also say as one of the co-organizers of the panel, thank you for agreeing to moderate. And special thanks also to the Associate Director of the Cornell Institute, Patty Hageman, who's done tremendous work behind the scenes to, to bring us all together and coordinate us. And we would not be able to do this without her. So thank you, Patty. Um, I, I was... I think ropes into this case because of a, an article that I wrote in, in 2013 in the Harvard Law Review called The Dangers of Surveillance, which uh, was published, uh, I don't know if it was good timing or bad timing, but literally two weeks before 
the Snowden revelations uh, were made public by, by The Guardian and The New York Times, uh, which, of course, led to um, Max Schramm's filing his first complaint with the Data Protection Commissioner of Ireland in the, I think, the late summer of, of 2013. Um, Andy was in a hotel room when he got ropes into the case. I was in a Starbucks. I just it was a Thursday night, and I just dropped my daughter off at a at a public service event that she was doing um, in the run up to Christmas. Um, and I was preparing to teach Shrems the next day in privacy law, and so I was sitting in a Starbucks with my laptop and literally reading the, the decision in Shrems one um, when I got with apologies to any European judges uh, who were present, bored by the decision. So I tabbed over to see if I'd received any email. Um, and there was another one of these weird emails from someone uh, in, in Ireland saying, could you be involved in, in this case? And and the, the funny part of the email was, you know, are you familiar with, with Shrems 1? I said, well, I'm just, I'm actually rereading it for class tomorrow. So um, I was brought, I think I was the last expert to be, to be brought in. So I had both the benefit of all of the prior briefing um, by by all of the other experts, the the, the three here, um, ad additional non testifying experts, and, and Facebook's two experts, uh, Peter Swire and Steve Vladek. The downside was that I basically had to to check everything and 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 say that you know, what was right and what was not, and be prepared to to defend uh, the, those conclusions under under oath. In, in particular, uh, we were all independent experts, but I was. Uh, hired by the data protection commissioner um i was asked to offer an opinion on andy's brief um and andy and i had never met but we knew each other's work and weirdly uh, we don't normally do this we were actually facebook friends ironically given the nature of of facebook being the, the, the key adverse party to the dpc um so i offered opinions on everything but particularly on on remedies uh which which andy and ash have already talked about on standing and particularly on this this concreteness requirement that 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 Ashley had mentioned the Supreme Court in a civil case had significantly typed a case called Spokio or as the Irish lawyers pronounced it lyrically Spokio um, had the Supreme Court had significantly tightened standing requirements in a decision I, I believe a year before maybe the July before um, and even though it was a civil case, standing is a constitutional doctrine under American law. So the, the ruling, the requirement that the, the all cause of action be concrete as a matter of law, a new requirement under American law, was one that further made it, made it even more difficult potentially for, um, for civil rights uh, anti-surveillance plaintiffs to, to ha even to have their day in court. Um, and I also offered opinions on on Privacy Shield um, and, and took the position um, as, as Ashley, similar to what Ashley just mentioned, that if there's an agreement by, by executive fiat, that's not binding, right? That the, the, the decisions by political actors um, to, to allow uh, certain kinds of procedures or to protect certain kinds of rights are not the same under American law as under European law as a legally binding judgment um, on law passed by the legislature um, or placed in the constitution and the permanent and um, enforceable. So the, the four things that surprised me about the about my involvement in the case. First was the, the Irish mechanism of independent experts. In, in American litigation, uh, experts are nominally independent, but in practice, they are very often essentially hired guns, as, as the expression goes, for the party that's retained. But we had to take oaths that we would have given the same evidence had we be retained by by an adverse party. I think that led in, in a number of really interesting cases to collaboration among the experts, in particular, during a reconciliation of our points of agreement and, and disagreement, which, which on the whole was, was conducted with uh, exemplary good faith by, by all of the experts involved, regardless of, of who was paying their, their fees. The, the, the second thing that surprised me was quite how aggressive uh, Facebook was proceeding in, in the litigation. Um, I, they took certain positions um, that, that I thought just weren't warranted by by, by, by the law, but uh, perhaps that is the American tradition of zealous advocacy um, uh, intruding into, into Irish procedure. Uh, the third thing that surprised me was even though there was extensive briefing on the privacy shield, and even though the privacy shield ultimately uh, became the most noteworthy portion of the European, European Court of Justice's holding, in terms of the cross-examination, there was 
almost no discussion of of the privacy shield that, that facebook did not ask me about that um that the dpc's lawyers didn't interrogate me and i believe that was true for almost all of the other experts the evidence was there our briefs were uh, in another somewhat surprising uh, procedural quirk were almost entirely read into evidence by by the Irish lawyers in the early days of the trial. Um, but I was I was puzzled um, why there wasn't greater discussion of the privacy shield in the the direct and cross examination of the of the, the five witnesses in Dublin um, almost exactly four years ago this week. And finally, the fourth thing that that I think is is worth noting was that because this was four years ago this week, uh, Donald Trump had recently been inaugurated as president. Uh, I can remember uh, before going to, to dinner with, with Andy one night, um, hearing uh, the, the Sean Spicer discussion of the size of the inaugural crowd. So there was great uncertainty about what kind of administration the Trump administration was going to be, how committed to civil liberties and, and the rule of law it was going to be. Um, and I think it was it was interesting that there was almost no formal discussion of that, uh, whether among the experts reconciliations um, or at, during the trial. But it was certainly a, a looming spectral presence over over the trial. It, if, as, as seemed to be the case, one of the major issues was American law's commitment to the rule of law and to the protection of fundamental rights, um, then questions about American law's conti continued ability to do that and the American executive's continued ability to make commitments to those uh, important values was was nevertheless something that was very much in the air in Dublin in in the early weeks of 2017. And I will I will stop there. Thank you very much, Neil. That's very interesting, of course, because um, I mean I think this is one of the interesting thing about both Trump's cases that they both happened after what, what we would normally call in in Europe constitutional moments. You know when something really important has happened in the world, and I think the same probably. I mean, the Trump's one was after after the Snowden revelations, and then of course, you know, Trump's two started immediately after the, Donald Trump came into um, power. So maybe that's one of the things we might have to talk about later on in the discussion. You know, what you think these sort of practical, real life events, what impact they actually had on on the way in which the proceedings were conducted, and also, you know, ultimately the outcome of the uh, of the court's decision. Uh, so, let, but let's uh, go to our final participant before, and uh, that is Alan Butler, who is the interim executive director and general counsel at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC, in Washington. Uh, uh, Mr. Butler, Alan has filed many briefs on behalf of EPIC in emerging privacy and civil liberties cases, and he's argued on behalf of EPIC um, on national security and open government and debt protection issues. He's a graduate of UCLA Law School and Washington University in St. Louis, where Neil now works. Um, and he's a member of the DC Bar and the State Bar of California. He's also a co-chair of the Privacy and Information Protection Committee of the ABA section on civil rights and social justice. And as we have already heard, he uh, um, EPIC was actually uh, providing amicus brief to the uh, proceedings. So Alan, do you want to talk about that? Absolutely, and uh, thanks again for having me uh, for CPDP and the Cordell Institute for coordinating this. Uh, as Judith mentioned, I represented uh, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC, <coughs> in the case. And building off of uh, what Ashley discussed earlier, there was a proceeding in 2016 uh, in the Irish High Court where the court recognized early on that there were many parties with interests in equities in this case and actually opened up a process for applications for amicus submissions and ultimately picked uh, two industry uh, groups on the US side and the European side, picked the United States and then picked uh, EPIC as an amicus to provide, uh, offer a counterbalancing perspective from the US government on the position in the US, recognizing our ex particular expertise on surveillance and related legal matters. And as Ashley mentioned, one of the interesting dynamics uh, of this amicus submission process in the Irish procedural rules was that EPIC was admitted uh, formally as a party as amicus to make legal submissions, and which ultimately allowed us to make submissions uh, in the European Court of Justice for the first time later. But we weren't allowed to introduce our own evidence because the evidence uh, was being introduced by the parties in the form of these expert uh, state witness testimony and expert reports. And so our role in the case there, 
became making legal submissions that highlighted uh, the material submitted by the experts uh, and, and highlighted you know, our views of what the most critical kind of legal dimensions of the case are. And I think it's also a bit, uh, as a US lawyer, kind of hard to wrap your head around the fact that in this case, uh, the central questions of US law were evidentiary or factual questions, right? That's why uh, Neil and Andy uh, and, and Peter and Steve Vladek and others were uh, making these evidentiary submissions very much focused on US law. And, and then Epic in our submissions focused in on that evidence to make arguments about uh, the, the issues of EU law and fundamental rights with respect to uh, what was happening in the US, both on a technological and legal perspective. So we, in our submissions, focused on a few key issues that were related but not identical to what um, at sort of Ashley and Neil mentioned before. And in particular, we, we keyed in on the fact that, you know, the central dispute underlying this case was the use of US surveillance uh, technological powers and also legal authorities to obtain the data of EU citizens without uh, complying with the principles of, of fundamental rights in the EU. And despite the fact that, as Ashley mentioned, you know, Facebook's uh, attorneys submitted evidence of, and the US you know, submitted materials about the various sort of legal avenues to legal remedies in the US, for violations of US surveillance law, intentional uh, you know, over collection and the like, violations of Fourth Amendment rights, the core sort of disconnect was that EU citizens who are outside of the United States do not have rights under the US Fourth Amendment and do not have any means of redress for collection that they allege violated their fundamental rights in Europe if that collection was authorized by US law. And that was the central dispute in the case. And so we really tried to highlight that fact to draw the court's attention to um, kind of this, the fundamental issue of lack of redress. Uh, and that ultimately was a central issue both in the high court and in the court of justice proceedings where we made submissions as well. And we were represented uh, by local counsel uh, because of the Irish procedure rules uh, at, the, at FLAC, which is a tremendous organization. Uh, both at the high court level and at the court of justice. Uh, and we're really happy to be a part of this case. And, and uh, I'm happy to chat as we go through the questions about some of the things I found significant and interesting about the case, but I'll kick it back to, so we can proceed with that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, I think one of the things that have come out of the, um, of all, you know, four presentations in a way is this importance of two things essentially. One of them is the question of standing, uh, of uh, you know, the ability of EU citizens to have their day in court, as Neil it, uh, called it in the US, if indeed their data was accessed by US law enforcement or US intelligence services. And the other one was, of course, the substantive question of um, whether or not they have fourth, fourth Amendment protection that isn't somehow equivalent to the kind of fundamental rights protection they enjoy within the EU. So one of the questions that I'm, you know, as a European, as the only European, full European in this, uh, on this panel, one of the things that always really interested me was really coming back to, you know, were you surprised by this decision? Quite a few things, of course, happened between Schrems and uh, Schrems One and Schrems Two. So, on the one hand, the U.S. adopted some laws to to improve the situation. We had the Privacy Shield. On the other hand, Donald Trump came in, and by the time the the, the case got going properly, we had the executive order. Um, so, how do you feel? You know, when you went into this, did you actually think that the U.S. at that point in time had done enough, and that there was a chance of the court saying? okay, you know, our very restrictive criteria that we set out in TRIMS 1 are actually fulfilled here and, and, you know, there is not much more else to say. Or did you already think that this was going to happen? Don't know who wants to go first on this one. Maybe somebody, one of the ones, you know, not, not maybe, yeah, um, somebody who acted for the, uh, for Facebook and Andrew, that was you, I think. What, no, what no, no, I, I, I acted Facebook, for uh, the DPC. I did not act for Facebook. Um, DPC, okay, yeah, but yeah. for the DPC in this context. Uh, so uh, how, how did you feel about this? Uh, so uh, 
the results surprised me in the sense that um, so my report, if you look at it, didn't even cover Privacy Shield because it wasn't enacted. It wasn't fully implemented by the, when I when the case started, and so it came in kind of almost halfway through the case. And so Facebook really raised it as a, a way to defend SCCs on adequacy. And I think, you know, if you just said to me the end, I could have seen both mechanisms surviving. I could have seen both going down. I was surprised that Privacy Shield went down and SCC stayed. Um, I thought it would be either sort of extreme that they felt, good, you know, this was enough or they felt that this wasn't enough. But I think the fact that they left SCCs up with, um, you know, I think it's a good thing, but I do think that that was a little bit of a surprise, particularly because the case really, the litigation centered on SCCs and Privacy Shield kind of came in halfway through uh, due to Facebook. Do you think that they, I mean, this is an interesting question, obviously, from a, from a practic practical perspective and a practitioner's perspective, do you think that the SECs actually did stand up or do stand up now for vis-a-vis -vis the US? Because, of yeah. course, I think one of the reasons why they kept them going is because they are used with other countries as well, countries that do not necessarily have the same issues as the US. So they are technically you know, possible yes. uh, now, but are they in practice possible given? Well, I, I think you have to say they are because obviously they invalidated Privacy Shield, which is a US mechanism and didn't say there's zero, th there's no possibility of using SCCs with the US. And I think that's one of the interesting things of the, the decision. Um, and that would look, the number of parties that asked them to do that in that case is, is long and distinguished, right? That was certainly before the CJU and they chose not to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the other questions I've, uh, I have, again, from a European perspective here also, is uh, one of the issues, of course, and, and some of you alluded to that already, is this distinction between what we would call universal human rights, that, that you know, the, the concept we're using in Europe, and the sort of civil rights, uh, civil liberties concept that you're using in the US, which ultimately means that EU citizens do not actually, um, you know, enjoy protection of and so on. Is this something that when you were um, giving testimony that did this, is this something that came clear there or, or how did you feel about this distinction? How, how did the courts react or did, did the court say anything in this particular area? Don't know who would like to talk. Neil, do you want to fight? Sure. I want to say a little bit of surprise and then I'll talk about universal human rights. I, I was like Andy, I, I, well, I was, I was not surprised that the CJEU basically reiterated its conclusion in Schrems 1 that we mean what we're doing here. Right? And I think that there's, there's a couple of reasons. One is that uh, Schrems 2 was not all that different from, from Schrems 1. There was Privacy Shield, mm -hmm. there had been some executive reforms of surveillance, there had been some statutory, but, but most of the reforms uh, were, were discretionary. Um, and I think also, as a someone who's also a constitutional lawyer, I see the CJEU trying to show that it is useful in a way that the American Supreme Court did in the Marbury case. And right, this is what constitutional courts do. But I think uh, a court to say one thing and then a few years later say, "Well, we didn't really mean it," is in a sense a, internally an abdication of, of, of its own authority. I think what I was not, I was a little surprised, as Andy said, that the, the SECs may have survived, but Privacy Shield went down, only insofar as if if Safe Harbor was was unlawful under the European law, well, then a contract cannot protect you from surveillance, right? That you and I, Judith, can't create a contract and, and stop the spies from listening to our communications. And so th that, that did surprise me. On the human rights point, I think Americans believe in in universal human rights. It's just uh, American law believes in universal human rights for Americans. Um, in other words, that Americans under American law have human rights wherever they go. Um, but there is a there is a tendency in American law that, as a as an old case put it well once, the Constitution uh, doesn't always follow the flag, right? So that uh, when when people are abroad, um, they are uh entitled to less protections I, I think 
you know, there's been a push in, in American politics in recent year, in recent weeks, sorry, in the last week, th things are moving quickly here, to rename the word alien, which applies to people like me who are non-US citizens living in the United States, um, and, and replace it with foreign persons. There, there's this very um, insular approach to, to many things in the United States, and I think constitutional rights are, are, are one of them. And there is a basic, currently a fundamental inconsistency between the American approach and the European approach, but I think it potentially could be fixed if there were to be a treaty or, or other legal instrument that extended those rights to EU citizens. Thank you very much, Niels. Anybody else want to say anything about the fundamental rights question? I just wanted to, about? Yeah, I wanted to jump back to the question about whether uh, I was surprised by the, the court's opinion. And I think I was a little less surprised in part because Max Schrems' arguments all along were that privacy shield invalid, but that the SECs could still stand as a mechanism. And so because I was more familiar with that set of arguments, I was in some respects maybe less surprised by what the court did. But I think I read the court's opinion uh, a little differently than Andy does and that I think because its detailed analysis of U.S. law makes so clear that U.S. law suffers from these fundamental defects, even though the court technically allowed SECs as a mechanism to stand, I think it was signaling that um, companies need to proceed with extreme caution in using SECs for transfers to the United States. And I think now the European Data Protection Board has issued this draft guidance um, that I think faithfully applies and interprets the Court of Justice's opinion and essentially prohibits the vast majority of transfers using SECs from the EU to electronic communication service providers in the United States who may be subject to this PRISM surveillance under Section 702. Um, and I think that that draft guidance is, is correct, and I, I do think it flows from the Court of Justice's opinion, although I know mine's different. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one of the questions, of course, that arise now in this context is now, now that we've got the decision, what do you think is going to happen going forward? And, uh, you know, as somebody who lives in the UK, who a similar approach to the US in, in, I think when Neil and I discussed it, he said he called it pragmatic, you know, um, in, in this context about how you would generally approach uh, a conflict like the one that has now opened up between has now opened up again between the us and the eu you know how are we going to cope with this how are we going to deal with this going forward and one of the issues of course as has come out of this now is that with the secs generally standing because the court did not want to nullify something that is used with other countries as well uh, but making you know it very clear, as you said, Ash, that you know with regard to the U.S. in particular, there are very very specific issues that arise, and and that it, it looks difficult, at least in practice, uh, for individual debt controllers and, and and the recipients of the data from the EU to overcome. What do you think is going to happen in terms of how we are going to resolve this? Um, and let me start with with Alan here. Maybe what do you think in this context? Sure. Um, so keying the answer to this question back to, to kind of my initial reaction at the hearing at the Court of Justice and the outcome, um, I felt that the critical point that led to this decision about invalidating the shield decision, adequacy decision, and it nevertheless not invalidating the SCC adequacy decision kind of came to a crux during the European Commission's presentation where I think the court was very receptive to the argument that, you know, the SEC's, the underlying SEC decisions couldn't themselves be invalid because their the application of those uh, decisions depended on what country you're sending it to, who was sending it, uh, whereas the Privacy Shield decision was invalid because it was premised on uh, a conclusion by the European Commission that U.S. law provided adequate protection. So we start there with what happens next. Well, as Ash said before, the next step in the U.S. is to provide adequate protection through, you know, actual legal rights established in law, and so that requires amending uh, both, you know, FISA potentially the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, uh, and providing, you know, a mechanism 
for individuals to, one, to limit the type of mass uh, surveillance and processing that uh, the court found was permissible under 702 and 12333, and two, to provide a mechanism for you know, meaningful redress if there's an allegation that Europeans' rights have been violated. And the, the reality was neither of those things happened under the shield. Uh, the closest they got to redress was the ombudsman mechanism, which never seemed to, to do much. And I think ev even if it had worked exactly as described, uh, wasn't sufficient. So I think that legal reform in the US is the necessary next step. Renegotiating a privacy shield or safe harbor 3.0 is just going to result in the same outcome if there's not fundamental legal reform. So what you're, what you're extent, and extent, what you're alluding here too is actually this, that we are having to go, we're having to overcome two difficult burdens. One of them is the existence of a privacy law in the US. So the, the adequacy part of it, as you say, which is what the privacy shield tries to do. And the other one is this extra requirement under the GDPR that, you know, the, the remainder of the legal framework in the recipient country, like the human rights framework, um, you know, and, and the other is generally the access of governments to personal data once it's in the country, that that also has to be um, addressed, essentially. So yeah. would you say that while the Privacy Shield tried to do one, you know, the, the remaining action of the US at that point in time didn't actually manage to address the other? And, and this is where we still are. So I think the, the question there then is, um, how do you assess the chances of that happening going forward? You know, the, the I think I'm just actually looking at the whole, um, at the, at the um, article in the GDPR where it says, you know, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, relevant legislation. So to what extent do you think uh, this is actually a barrier that can be overcome going forward? Well, I think we're at a really unique moment in the U.S. right now because as we transition into the new Congress, there is building and building momentum to address privacy issues at the federal level, including through enacting a comprehensive privacy law in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, in addition to um, the sort of uh, motivation of the invalidation of privacy shield from an economic perspective will give you know weight to those who uh, advocate that congress needs to reform some of these underlying surveillance authorities at the same time they establish comprehensive baseline uh, data protection law in the united states so i think it's certainly possible it's it's difficult in part because amending surveillance authorities is always uh you know, a tough sell can be a tough sell in Congress, especially when those reforms are not focused on the rights of U.S. citizens, as, as Neil noted. Uh, but I think that, again, there is a major motivating factor here, which is the potential financial impact of uh, the disruption of transatlantic data flows on U.S. interests that will support, are able to support or lobby Congress. And I'll and maybe you, weigh in there. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, go ahead. So, and going back maybe to one one thing Ash said, and I, I, we've certainly disagreed in the past on this and probably still do, um, you know, bulk is maybe not the word I'd use and one can debate it, but I think the, it, look, the EDPV guidance, even when it comes out of draft form, is just that. It's not binding on the DPAs, I don't think. And I think it goes to, uh, you know, again, the point I think I was raising, which is, um, they've even laid out a path really through technology, which is encryption, um, to say that SCCs may work under that scenario. And I think what is, um, and again, you have a U.S. lawyer saying it, but what I think is missing is, you know, GDPR in this really takes somewhat of a risk-based approach. And if the point of, of, you know, a technological solution is surveillance can't happen, even if you accept the sort of framework that 702 is bulk, um, it isn't, bulk isn't everywhere, right? And so there's certain data flows that just aren't that interesting to the national security apparatus of the United <clears throat> States. And so I do think there's even a path there of saying, if you, you know, if you haven't gotten a 702 on these types of data, um, whether it's encrypted or not, and you can get some level of comfort that there's other controls in place, the fact that it isn't being surveilled may be sufficient to try to get you further down the road. So I think there's two pieces to me that are relevant here. There's what did the U.S. do, what can it do or not do to sort of 
deal with the perception that this is bulk and, and how often it happens. The remedy is much tougher to me because at the end of the day, um, the remedy ultimately has constrained by the United States Constitution. And a lot of what Neil and I testified about and Ash did as well was not just what are the existing remedies under these statutes, but what is the legal limit of those? And while you can change the first, it's hard to change the second in the United States without amending the Constitution. And I think that is just a, a an overarching issue that that's very hard to deal with. I would love to follow up on that. There's a lot there that Andy said Absolutely. that I think warrants a response. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm not surprised. First, <laughs> on remedies, uh, everyone's absolutely right. The standing is a, a requirement that flows from the Constitution. Nevertheless, the Supreme Court has been clear that Congress has a role to play in defining what constitutes an injury for the purposes of standing. So standing has several elements. One element is that you have to show that you are injured. And one thing that Congress can do in the surveillance context is make clear that if, for example, an individual takes protective measures to avoid surveillance, those protective measures can qualify as an injury for the purposes of standing. And then you get past some of these difficult, thorny, evidentiary questions about how do you prove the existence of secret surveillance. In this scenario, you don't have to prove the surveillance, you instead prove that you took these protective measures in response to um, a reasonable threat. And Senator Ron Wyden has proposed a reform along these lines in the past, um, and it's something that I think we may see uh, coming up in Congress again soon. I think it's it's a reasonable reform. Congress definitely has a role to play here. The Supreme Court's made that clear in Spokio and, and in other decisions. And then um, I think what Andy was saying about 702 and, and the EDPB warrants a response as well. And I, I just wanna be clear, you know, our position is not that Section 702 qualifies as bulk surveillance. We do uh, sometimes refer to it as a kind of mass surveillance because of its scale. But Section 702 involves the U.S. government applying selectors, so there are targets. The problem is that the targeting standard is extremely low and the number of targets is extremely high. Another problem is that the executive branch possesses tremendous discretion to target virtually any non-US person abroad. And for that reason, the surveillance lacks the objective criterion that the Court of Justice required in Shrems 1. Um, and for that reason, oh, um, and for that reason, uh, it, I think it's, it's critical that we take a look at what entities are potentially required to provide information to the government under Section 702. Um, I'm not an expert in EU law, but based on my understanding of EU law, what is really critical to this analysis is what U.S. law permits. And U.S. law permits U.S. intelligence agencies to acquire information under Section 702 from electronic communication service providers who are in the U.S. And the definition of electronic communication service provider is very broad. Um, I understand what Andy is saying about a risk-based approach under the GDPR, but at the same time, I think it is important to look to um, the scope of what U.S. law permits, and that scope is very broad. Um, also, when talking about encryption, finally, I just I think it's important to differentiate between encryption for communications in transit and encryption of communications at rest. And the the real practical problem here is that. Because the vast majority of use cases, the companies in the U.S. that are receiving data need to be able to access and read the data. If they can access and read the data, that means that if they're electronic communication service providers, they may have to provide that data in readable form to the NSA. And that's really the problem. So encryption of communications in transit will not solve that problem. Okay, let me maybe take some of the questions from the audience here. Things on this? Sorry. We've got some questions here. So the first one is from Laura Drexler. The EU has also uh, data protection rules for the law enforcement sector, as we know, which aren't governed by the... Sorry, Neil, you were talking. Oh, we must be on a lag, it was a while ago. I just, I, I wanted to wait on, like, on the, the standing point and on the reform point, but if you want to go to questions, that's fine. Yeah, maybe maybe we can go because I'm, I'm just having an eye on the time, but you can come back to that maybe in, in that context because I think some of them are actually. Okay, so the EU, as we know, also has a debt protection rules for the law enforcement sector. So this is not covered by the GDPR, but it's covered by a special directive um, with transfer rules parallel to the GDPR and also notably including the standard of essential equivalence. For transfers between the law enforcement authorities with the US, the EU has the umbrella agreement. 
And in light of your expertise in terms too, uh, the question here is, can the umbrella agreement upheld, up, uh, uphold the necessary standard of fundamental rights? And also considering that the umbrella agreement, unlike the privacy shield, does not include an assessment of US law on the matter, uh, what safeguards should be implemented in this context, do you think? Don't know if who would like to go first on this one. Um, Neil? <laughs> you asked me. Um, so I would say on two things. First, on, on questions about whether the, the umbrella agreement or even the the, the privacy shield can, can be enough. I, I would agree with, with Ashley's point that um, law is really needed here. And binding agree right the, the, from a european perspective and and judith is, is the only full european on the panel is, is it, correct me if i'm wrong but but fundamental rights are fundamental they are they are binding they, they are not the kind of thing that can be could be abrogated if uh, if an elected official changes changes their mind uh, I, I was in a uh, i was asked to testify before congress uh, a few weeks ago about the impact of trends two on federal privacy reform i want to agree entirely with alan about what he was saying about the privacy reform, both on the, the commercial side and on the surveillance side, is on the agenda in this Congress once the constitutional crisis prompted by the, the transition um, gets gets put to bed. I think it's, it's important that we, maybe as American lawyers, thank Europe for, for calling, uh, sort of, forcing America's hand on both sides of that, right? That the GDPR has forced the commercial side and the Schrems litigation has forced the, the surveillance side. One of the, the panelists at the, the Senate hearing was a, was a political appointee from the Trump administration overseeing the, the ombuds process. And, and he just didn't get it. He didn't he had a, a, a shocking incuriosity, maybe not so shocking, but an incuriosity about European law, a, a fundamental misunderstanding about European law, that the position of the outgoing administration was that uh, there is not an emerging global consensus on what privacy requires, um, which is shocking to anybody, I think, not in uh, the, the Trump administration. It certainly will be shocking, I think, to most people attending this conference. There is an emerging standard, and it's the GDPR. Um, and so I think that the the this thing like the the umbrella group is more than the the privacy shield, but something like the the privacy shield ombuds procedure, which functioned basically like a glorified complaints desk to the U.S. intelligence community, is not enough under European law. And I think that was clear in Schrems one, and it's very clear under Schrems two. The second thing I'll say just on on the the Ash Andy uh, colloquy, which is which is fascinating and and delightful and constructive, um, is that. When we talk as American lawyers, this is mostly for Europeans, when we talk as American lawyers about standing being a constitutional doctrine, it is. Um, but it's it's that very rare beast. It's a it's a it's an extra textual uh, doctrine that conservative jurists like, right? There's no standing clause of the US Constitution, and standing has proven to be a very controversial doctrine. And in practice, um, yes, you could amend the Constitution, but the most likely way that the doctrine is going to change or evolve is through judicial personnel. Now, unfortunately, um, while the Trump administration didn't understand European human rights law, it did understand judicial politics and uh, has appointed 200 some, on the whole, highly conservative judges um, who will take it, I think, on balance, a very restrictive view of standing doctrine. So at, with respect to, the, as Andy said correctly, I think the, the binding constitutional nature of of standing, limiting the ability of Americans to, to engage in reform here, um, the standing problem as an empirical matter is only likely to get worse in the near future rather than better. That's an interesting point you make there, but let me maybe go back to the one that you made before as well, which is the um, the difference in perception maybe between the US and, and the EU in this context. And for me, and the UK as not having a written constitution and not having experience really, you know, in the same way with constitutional law cases. I can kind of see why they 
might view this as a political issue. The UK, in its negotiations with the EU for adequacy and all of this, or, you know, it very much has approached this as a political, uh, we can do a deal kind of, you know, um, way of doing this. Whereas with the US, which actually has a very strong national constitutional framework, I mean, you guys know that when the Supreme Court says it can't be done, it can't be done, at least not now, you know, that, that you, you will have to find a way around it, you will have to pass a new law. And essentially, isn't that what, what the EU has now done? It has a, it has a quasi-constitutional court, which basically has said that this thing that the executive wanted to do and ultimately did do with the US, you know, this political agreement that they reached, it cannot stand in law. And it cannot stand in law because it violates the constitution of Europe, essentially, that it violates the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and therefore it cannot be done in this way. So how do you feel the US, you know, approaches this? Is this very much a political approach where, where you still think, uh, you know, economic power and political power in the world, and we're going to get this through somehow, which to me seems very clearly the approach that was taken at the time of the safe harbor. You know, we, we, the EU made, did not make a lot of exceptions, but they made one for the US and then they made one for the US again with regard to the privacy shield. Or do you think that with Schrems 2, where the court now has actually really put its foot down again and said, no, this is a question of the rule of law. It's not a question of political negotiation. And if you want to change this, you need to change something. So now we're having two constitutions and standoff, essentially. So, so how do you think this is going to, you know, be resolved ultimately? I'm particularly interested in, again, hearing from the constitutional lawyers on the panel on this one. Well, I think po politicians cut deals, right? That, that's what they do. Um, that's how we got the SCCs. That's how we got Safe Harbor, which was, you know, it, it, to, to use an English expression, kind of a bodge, right? It was fudged together. And Privacy Shield is just sort of, you know, uh, I, I don't know, extra strong fudge, right? That it's just, it, they will make deals, but judges won't. And, and mm -hmm. I, as readily, certainly. And I think that that's where you see the insistence from the ECJ on uh, on the, the, the need for enforceable judicial protections. And I think it's where you'd also, you see limitations on, uh, by American judges on the requirements of, of Article Three standing, particularly concreteness and, and other elements of the, again, right, entirely judge-made test. Um, I think Ashley's suggestion about uh, the, the, the widen approach, right, that there are pathways in American law where Congress can act. Um, and I think there are things, there are commitments that the United States can make. And, and again, right, maybe, uh, something more binding than than an executive commitment or, or promise like a like a treaty or or like a statute there, there are ways to do this um and i think it, this is one thing i learned in, in testifying this is squarely on congress's agenda and it is squarely bipartisan at least that this is a problem and i think as alan pointed out really astutely the economic force of the of the 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 benefit of these transactions across the atlantic is, is something, um, at least on the American right, uh, which tend to be uh, more restrictive of fundamental rights, the, the economic interest here, I think, m might allow for some kind of compromise, certainly on commercial privacy, but, but maybe also on surveillance privacy, if it's just the Europeans. But, but right, any predictions about what's to come in this new Congress, I think, have to be, have to be tempered um, with, by the reality that we are living in um, politically and constitutionally, um, highly unusual times in the United States in 2021. Thank you. Uh, just to follow um, up, we've got, sorry, we've got we've got about five minutes left. If it's possible, if it's okay with you, I would quite like to come to the last question that we have from the audience, uh, and I think that's maybe one for Andrew because it's quite practical. So. Uh, the question is, do you think that Executive Order 12333 is relevant in the question in, the, in relation with adequacy? And if yes, what are the implications for companies and data exporters using SECs, uh, zero transfers of data if they're not encrypted? What is your view on this one? What are you telling your clients at the moment? Yeah, uh, 12333 is an interesting one because I think, you know, again, I, I, I may be biased by my sort of in, involvement in the case, but I think the case started, you, you, know, you have to look at where we started, right, which was concern over the NSA gathering data that had been transferred to the U.S. Uh, from U.S. companies uh, under 702. 
And I think what got a little, uh, and, and Ash uh, in no way is the one that did this, but conflated in the case uh, by others, is 12 triple three FISA is a way to force U.S. companies that are on U.S. soil, basically, to give data over to the U.S. government. I mean, that's what it does. Uh, there's other parts of it. There's ways they do it. But that's fundamentally what it allows the U.S. government to do. 12 triple three is related but different, which is it is authority for the intelligence community to use the, the constitutional power of the president as well as what's been delegated under Article I uh, to the president by Congress to gather foreign intelligence not on U.S. soil. And so I think one of the, the things that's interesting is, and I, I recognize transit authority and, and the ability to tap underseas cables, but those are different things uh, because the data is not in the U.S. inherently when it's being pulled off of an undersea cable. And it may be in the process of being transferred. One can debate that, but it also could be being transferred from, you know, the EU to the UK and they have they have a tap. And so I think that to me is one of the things that's um, maybe a little less, I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but it's it's less important because there's not a compulsory component to it uh, for the ECSs uh, if, if they're operating not on US soil. So I, I don't dismiss it, but I think the other issues that are much more core to SCCs around 702 um, are, are the, the harder issues and frankly the ones that are more relevant for companies because again you're dealing with data that's in the U.S. versus data that's being pulled potentially from underseas cables that's not in the U.S. Okay thank you very much uh, I'm afraid we come to the end of this panel it's gone very very quickly I'm afraid so let me just use this opportunity to say thank you very much to all of our panelists thanks for Neil and Andrew and Ash and Alan um, I hope, uh, I think this is probably going to be on the internet afterwards for other people and um, let's come back next year and see where we are because if indeed the US, uh, the new US administration is going to make some changes, I'm sure we're going to want to talk about what those changes are and whether they're going to meet, you know, the criteria. So thank you very much everybody and um, until next year. <laughs>